All right, guys, in our last section of chapter 12, we're going to be learning about inverse trig functions, which I guess we're not really learning about them. We're going to be really fine-tuning them. We've done a lot of work with inverse functions already, you know, sine inverse, cosine inverse, all that stuff. Um, so I'm going to give you some notation. And more importantly, we're going to be dealing with what they would look like as a graph. And there's an example right here over on the right-hand side. Um, you can see it's basically just what the graph would look like if you kind of flip it over on its side, if you swapped all the x's and y values. And so what ends up happening that ends up being a problem for us is that the inverse is not a function. Remember, a function, you have to be able to pass the vertical line test. And this is far from passing the vertical line test because since the function's periodic, normal sine functions just repeat over and over again this way. This inverse function just would repeat over and over again, which means there would be just an unlimited number of y values for each x value, which makes it not a function. Um, so what we do is we end up doing what we call a domain restriction, and that domain restriction gets it down to a point where it is a function. So what we do with our sine function in particular is we take just this one little segment of it to make sure that none of the y values repeat. And so we go from this point right here to this point right here. And that way, if I'm just looking at this segment of it, every value gets covered once, but without repeating the same values over and over again. Okay, so we just take one little segment of it. So each one of these inverse trig functions is going to have a domain restriction, okay? So arc sine. In symbols, we write it as y equals sine inverse of x, and you guys have seen that before. We did that in previous sections in the chapter. Its domain goes from negative one to one, all right, lowest possible x value is negative 1, highest possible x value is positive 1, and that just flips the range from the original function because before, your y values could go from negative 1 to 1, so now that it's the inverse function, your x values can go from negative 1 to 1. You can see the farthest it goes to the left is negative 1, farthest it goes to the right is positive 1. And then the range, this is the tricky part, this is the restricted domain. Um, here we're looking at this picture in radians, so I'm going to write it in radians first. It goes from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over two. We're not super comfortable with the radian measurements, so I'm also gonna write it as negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees. So by restricting the domains, we make sure that if we plug any x value, that we only have one possible y value, because let's use zero as an example. We wanna make sure that if we plug in zero, we get zero. Otherwise, we might get pi, we might get two pi, we might get negative pi, we might get negative two pi. We wanna make sure that there are no repeats. We choose this range so that if you pick a certain x value, you only get one y value in return. And I'll show you exactly what that means once we look at some specific examples. Okay, so that was sine. Let's look at arc cosine. And that word arc, that's just another word for inverse. Okay, so we've seen this before, inverse cosine. Same exact domain. Our domain restriction is gonna be a little bit different though if we look at our original sine and cosine functions. It's like here we choose sine going somewhere between negative 90 and positive 90 because that just covers one swoop of the y values. Here we cover one swoop starting at zero and ending at 180. Okay, so it just goes from the highest point down to the lowest point. That's just one pass of the cosine function. So we're going from zero to 180 here. Um, so in radians first, that would be from 0 to pi. And then in degrees, it would be from 0 to 180. So either measurement that you're more comfortable in, you can do degrees or radians. All right, and then tangent, we don't have much experience with. Y equals inverse tangent. Okay, so the domain, this one's a little bit strange. I'm going to show you. We didn't do much with this but we did have just a little picture of what the tangent graph looks like. So the tangent graph, instead of kind of waving up and down like sine and cosine do, it literally just goes forever down, forever up. So see how the range is all reals? That means for us, our domain is gonna be all reals. Okay, so remember we do that double blocked R for all reals. And then kind of the main pass of the trig function, just going from the lowest point up to the highest point, goes from negative 90 up to positive 90. All right, so that would be the pass that we would take through there, and that turns into our domain. Oops, I guess I should write that in radians as well. Okay, so those are your domain restrictions. It's going to be important when you're choosing which angle we end up using. All right, so first example. Find each value, write angle measures in degrees and radians. So we're basically trying to figure out what angle 
has a sign of root two over two. So here's a habit that I want you guys to get into. So this ends up being theta. So if we say that this is equal to theta, this is the same as saying that sine of theta is equal to root two over two. So if we're trying to figure out what it is, we can switch it back to the original inverse function and then we'll be able to figure out the angle. So make sure that when we choose this angle, it ends up somewhere between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So just for reference, we can use our unit circle. So I'm gonna flip you guys back to that. So we wanna figure out what value has a sine of root two over two. All right, so remember sine is the y value. And right here, we have a sine or y value of root two over two. So our angle would be 45 degrees. Okay, and then we can do another example. All right, in our second example, we've got arc cosine, which is just the same as cosine inverse. So we know it's gonna be equal to some angle. And this is the same if we switch from inverse cosine into regular cosine. It's the same as saying the cosine is equal to negative one. So let's find a value that has a cosine of negative one. So again, we can flip ourselves back to the unit circle here. So cosine is the x value. So if we find an x value of negative one, that would be this one right here. Okay, so our x value is negative one. Our angle is 180 degrees. Okay, so that's what you're doing for that type, is you're basically just going off the unit circle, recognizing those values, and tracing your way back to which angle gave you which sine or cosine. Okay, example two is going to be slightly different. We call these triangle problems. So what we're doing with these, we're finding the tangent of cosine inverse of four seven. So remember what this represents. This represents an angle, and it's the angle that has a cosine of four seven. So the very first thing we do with these problems is we set up a little triangle just based on this thing right here. Okay, so we're gonna set up a triangle. We're gonna make sure it has a cosine of four sevenths. So set up a little right angle. Throw your theta in either of the other angles. You can do the top if you want. So knowing that the cosine is four over seven, that means that's the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Okay, so in order to find the tangent of this angle, we need to find this last missing piece here. And we do that just like in the previous sections by doing Pythagorean theorem. So we do a squared, which is the one we don't know, plus four squared equals seven squared. And we can clean that all up. So a squared plus, this is 16, this is 49, and we subtract the 16 from both sides. So a squared ends up being 33, and to get a by itself, we can take the square root of both sides. So that piece that we were missing, that ended up being the square root of 33. Okay, so now if we wanna find the tangent of this angle, we just do normal tangent, just opposite over adjacent. So opposite is root 33, and then over adjacent, which is four. So that would be your answer. So the way we read that is the tangent of the angle with a cosine of four sevenths. So we first found the angle with a cosine of four sevenths and then found the tangent of that angle. Okay, so I think I have another one of those for you. Yes, I do. Okay, so the sine of the angle with a tangent of three eighths. Okay, so we know that this just ends up giving us back an angle. So we're gonna sketch out a little triangle representing that angle. So again, a right triangle, just like before, you can put the theta in either of those other spots, it won't make a difference. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So that means the opposite side is three, the adjacent is eight. Obviously, this is not drawn to scale. We're just doing this for the measurements. So we need to find the last piece in order to figure out what sine of that angle is. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Make sure the Pythagorean is done with everything in the right place. All right, so three squared is nine, eight squared, equals c squared, so add those together, you get 73 equals c squared, and square root both sides. So the missing piece that we just found was the square root of 73, and now I can find the sine of this angle. Okay, so sine of this angle, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so we write three over the square root of 73, and I'm gonna rationalize that, because I'm not supposed to have square roots in the denominator. So I end up with three root 73, and then over just to 73. Now these don't reduce, so we just leave our answer like that. Okay, so that's the second type. Last type of this that we're gonna have to do is something that we could just do in our calculator. Okay, so we know that cosine is equal to this right here, so this is what we did back in the beginning of chapter 12. If you had the cosine but didn't have the angle, you'd set up the inverse. So we write this as cosine inverse and then swap the negative 0.86 and the theta. So now theta's by itself, if I just plug this into the calculator, I will get the value of theta. 
so I can plug this in. So take your cosine inverse function of negative 0.86, and that gives us 149.3. And you can see from our options here that that matches with D. So a little practice with standardized test taking. All right, last example here. We have a ski trail shown over here. So this is your downward slope that we're looking at. We want to write an inverse trig function that can be used to find theta. Okay, so this, we, we did this before. With this, we did this in 12.1. So now we're just kind of tying it all together with this new inverse idea that we're doing overall. Okay, so according to this angle right here, 12 is the adjacent. So we know we're going to be using something that involves adjacent, so either cosine or tangent. And then 5 is the opposite, according to this angle right here. So that would be tangent. So we can set up tangent. So tangent of theta, remember tangent is always opposite over adjacent. So opposite is 5 over the adjacent, which is 12. And then it says to find the angle by doing that. So we set this up, and we can figure out what the angle is. So to get theta, we turn tangent into inverse tangent, and then we'll have the theta by itself. Okay, so now that theta is by itself, I just need to plug this left-hand side into the calculator and I will get a value that we're going to round to the nearest tenth. So inverse tangent of 5 over 12, round to the nearest tenth would be 22.6. And since that's an angle, that would be in degrees. Okay, so the angle of the slope is 22.6. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 12.